the mic. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Bates and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet. Billy Today's guest, actor, director, and Broadway star, D.W. Moffat. My brother. My brother Frankie. How are you, pal? Good, Good. to see you. I heard you went to Vegas this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's odd that you would open with a remark like that. <laughs> two nights, three days, you know. Two just, nights, uh, three days. Visit my money, see if they're taking care of it. Yeah, well, good. I, I, I have to, I have to say, you're looking especially like a New York cab driver today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know me, pretentious, Frank. I'm very pretentious. Yeah, very I'm always pretentious. worried about my clothes, my car. Yeah, all of that stuff really makes yep. a big difference to me. Yeah, forty dollars stocks. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, I. I uh, when I go to Vegas, I, I, I don't go to win money. I go there to not lose money. That's pretty much it. Have right. some fun, gamble, right. but not lose money. Because I know you can't win, you know. Right. And especially since the corporation's taken over and changed every freaking rule, there's right. no way you can win. But I like the I like the crap table. I like the jaw guard, you know. Like uh, you go good stick man if you get a good stick man. Craps, he didn't come and do it. He won't do it again. Danger's over. Double up and catch up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love all of that shit, you know, when you get a real – or even blackjack deal. I – uh. I had a couple of really funny blackjack dealers, not this time out, but in the past. I was playing blackjack one day, and I had a 10 and a 4, right? It was my hand that came to me. And the dealer says, that's a mother-in-law hand. It's a mother-in-law hand. What do you mean, mother-in-law hand? He goes, you know, you want to hit it, but you know you're really not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> so how much didn't you win? I lost about 500. But I had, <laughs> but I had, well, that's up 100 since the first time you told me it. The first time you told me, you said you lost 400. I think I lost, well, somewhere between four and five, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I, I got action. You know, I like the action. I tell you a great line I heard about craps, and I love this line. I read it somewhere. Maybe in Alger. Uh, I, I read it. It might have been David Runyon. No, it was a great line, though. The guy was so honest. He says, this guy was so honest, you could play craps with him over the phone. <laughs> I thought that's a great life for honesty. But yeah, I had a good time. You know, Vegas is cool, but uh, three days was enough of it. Two, uh, two nights. Two nights, yeah. Three days, yeah, I had enough. Uh, and you made it off the hill in time? It didn't it didn't snow in? Uh, yeah. That's when, I, that's when I should go to Vegas. You know, I mean, it's a four, day, it's four hours and 15 minute drive. And you brought soda bread today? I brought What'd you think bread. of the soda bread, Derek? I thought... Derek Harris, our third That's man a in the Patty's Day gift. It was a well, post Patty's. Well, first it it was uh, better than the last time. Oh, Ooh. really? Well, but because we... the last time was good too. It was much better than I than I thought it would be, and he made it uh, based on our specifications. Correct. Special orders. I usually don't take special orders. No caraway things. seeds. <laughs> no, and more more raisins. More raisins and, and more nuts. More nuts. Yeah. That's appropriate. You more know, nuts. Yeah, soda bread actually is is not as sweet as that usually. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's not usually that sweet. Well, raisins make it You have sweet. scones? You ever eat scones? Yeah. Well, you notice how scones are not super sweet. They're more they're more uh, flowery, you know? They're more like bread. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, while we have this lull in the conversation, our, our guest today is director D.W. Moffat. Uh, director, actor, producer. He's a great guy. And he's also the head of the film division at uh, Savannah College of Arts and Design. Yeah, I wanted to ask him a little bit about Savannah. I love that town. I think yep. it's a great town. I, yep. never, I didn't spend enough time down there, but I like it. And uh, he's also, I mean, the guy was an actor across the board, everywhere. From Absolutely. Broadway to TV to movies. Absolutely. Yeah, it'd be interesting to uh, have a conversation with him to find out where he's. Well, why don't, why don't we go to him now then? Well, we've done his build up. <laughs> well, I guess it's, we might it's, as it's well. It's such huh? a good build up. We it's might as well go to him now. Between talking to him and talking to you, Frank, I'm, he's not going to ask me what I did in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, I won't ask you why you were there either. All right. All righty. And with that, <laughs> let's segue off of this. <laughs> Can we bring on DW, my friend? Let's do it. Hey. There he is. How are you? Hey. How are you? Nice to see you, my friend. It's always great to be in the presence of the master, Frank Pace. Oh, that's always, that, always great. That's, always great. that's the true master, Billy O'Connor. Pleasure to know hey, you. Billy. And, hey, and Billy. And the, the genius behind the uh, council, Consul, Derek Harris. Hello, hello, hello. So, DW, where are you now? I'm at the Georgian Terrace Hotel 
across the street from the famous Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. And what are you doing there? I'm shooting a Fox TV show called Monarch that is um, a very big... If you can imagine um, Dallas meets Succession... And it's not oil, but it's country western music. That's kind of what this is. Wow, sounds That's pretty great. cool, right? Is it, what, what's it on? Or what? What? When will it be on? Or it'll it, uh, premiering in the fall. We were supposed to premiere um, in January. We had a great slot to premiere uh, after the NFC Championship game, and um, you know, like many productions, as you are certainly well aware of, Frank, uh, COVID kind of knocked us sideways there. And so they had to push everything back. And then they said, you know what? We're pushing so far back. Let's do this right. Let's get this thing sorted out. And then we'll premiere in the fall. And is it like an expose? Like you said, meet succession. Is it like an expose of the money behind the country and Western music business? It's sort of like, well, it's, it's um, you know, it's a big sprawling soap opera. And it's about power in the music business. But instead of being like the oil business, like Dallas, it's more uh, country. It's the country music business, but it's a little bit, you know, hipper and slicker than Dallas was. So that's why I alluded to uh, succession. How could you be in something that's hip and slick? You're the hip. You're, you're the hippest and slickest guy I know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you you bounce between Atlanta and Savannah, is that right, DW? Because uh, I, I Patty's Day I, just went by, and most people don't know it, but Savannah, Georgia, has the second biggest Patty's Day parade in the country, bigger yeah, than Boston. It's it's, it's insane. Um, I was actually in Atlanta for St. Patrick's Day, which I can't say is a bad thing because. St. Patty's Day, you know, it's like New Year's Eve. It's kind of amateur hour a little bit. What um, about? And so, you know, I, I don't need I don't need to be around that. Um, <laughs> so I basically uh, right now I am pinballing between Los Angeles, Savannah, and Atlanta. Okay, now so, uh, you are the chairman of the film and television division at Savannah's College of Arts and Designs, correct? I'm the chair of the film department, yes, at SCAD. I am. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Despite, those things, despite those things you wrote about me, Frank, <laughs> uh, I, they, they, still, they still gave me the gig, man. Even though you tried to, you know, they you tried you. to burn me up. I know, man, you did. I know you did. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I, I want to get to uh, SCAD a little bit later, but how did that how did that come about? I mean, that's amazing to me that you're the chairman of the film. I mean, look, you're an accomplished actor. You're an accomplished Broadway star. You're an accomplished director. Uh, I mean, I realize that you're... Cred. He's got cred. You, you got <laughs> a, immense credibility. But how did you get that job? You know, it's one of those great examples of you have to show up for life and you have to be when the right thing comes along at the right time, you have to be ready to say yes. And you have to be able to walk through the door with all of your faculties intact. And, um, funny pun, huh? funny pun faculties intact. Yeah. That might while you're fine. Exactly. <laughs> um, so to make a very long story short, I was invited to the Savannah, Film festival because the SCAD has a big film festival. It's an Oscar, you know, fest. It's an Oscar tracking film festival. And in 2015, a friend of mine, Bill Borden, who produced all the High School Musicals, um, invited me to come to Savannah to work to do workshops with students. And I'm in the hotel lobby getting breakfast, and a woman who's now my boss. Andrea Reeve Rab came up to me and said, what are you doing here? Because she was in casting and knew me from back in the day, New York casting, LA casting. And I said, I'm here to work with students with Bill Borden. And she goes, oh my God, would you come and talk to my performing arts students? And I said, of course I would. And I did that. And then I said, you know, I'm shooting a show now and I see you've got a, a showcase coming out to LA. Why don't you guys get in the van and come up to Santa Clarita and See what it's really like, you know, when, when you're doing a show. 
And she was like, oh my God, would you do that? Oh my God, that's so nice. So they brought their showcase kids out. And then that turned into me going back in May for a week long kind of master class thing. And then the leadership of the college came to me and said, what do you want? Like, we really like what you're doing. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd love to teach a couple of acting classes, but I also love to teach a couple of your directing classes. And they said, done, fine. When do you want to come? Here's where you'll stay. Here's what we'll pay you. Come in the fall of 2016. So in the fall of 2016, I came to teach for one quarter, four classes. And during that quarter, it became really clear to me that the film department could up its game radically, exponentially, if it did a couple of very simple things. So I reached out to the gentleman who's sort of the, you know, the El Jefe at the school. And I said, you have been so kind to me. Here is three pieces of paper on which I have summarized what I think could be done to really enhance your film department, because I think it could be amazing. And two days later, he called me back and he said, great, I love this. You want to do it? So that's how that happened. So how do you work out? How do you balance your work in Los Angeles, your work in Atlanta, your work for SCAD in Savannah? How do you balance all that out? Well, the you know, as you know, Frank, the, you know, UPMs hate to keep people in hotels, this week being an exception for me in Atlanta. You know, usually when I'm working as an actor, you know, when I did Chicago Med, I did 22 episodes. They would fly me up on a Thursday night. We don't have classes on Friday. I'd shoot out Friday. They'd fly me back Saturday morning. Boom. Done. Now, it's problematic as a director. Um, yes. I could direct an episode if I arranged it well. I can't, I can't be like, I'm a director for hire. I'm, I'm available. That's tougher. As an actor, it's not really an issue usually because productions usually work with me in terms of scheduling. Yeah. And what I'm uh, going to say to Billy is they can schedule around you. If, if 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 you're a, a good enough actor like Don Donald D W, um, they uh, all of the above, <laughs> all of the above. Uh, they you know you don't work every day where you're doing a sitcom or when you're directing you're working every day. You may be working two days out of five on, on a half an hour series or one day out of five or two days out of ten. So they can schedule around you. So, But they, they don't want to put you up in a hotel. Who is UPM, if you don't mind me asking? Unit production uh, manager. Oh, okay. The unit, yeah, the, the, the bean counter, of which Frank is the El Jefe. <laughs> oh, I can <laughs> hear that. El Papo de Puti Copy UPM. <laughs> <laughs> don't Frank. Don't uh, Frank. I, um, I, yeah. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. So go ahead, continue. Um, so, you know, um, I've... I was able to direct a little movie about two years ago, a little short comedy short, but in general, most of my uh, industry engagement has been as an actor the last four years. Um, but I hear there's this show coming to Atlanta, Frank, where they're going to hire me as a director. Maybe, you know, where I'm going to see what I can do about that. Yeah. Where'd you hear that? <laughs> on the down low. Yeah. On the down low. Um, <laughs> and it, Crystal still your wife Crystal is still in LA? Yeah, she's um she transitioned into real estate, Frank, and has has done really well. And you know, she grew up in LA, so she knows the town like nobody. And we have so many friends in the business, many in Europe, a lot on the East Coast. And when they come to LA, they're like, what the hell? It's like this huge thing. And Crystal's able to kind of Show them the neighborhoods, what studio are you going to be working at, where are you going to be shooting, how long are you going to be here. So she, her clientele is very much, uh, pretty much, uh, entertainment industry based, and she's doing really well. Um, that's, so that's great. Yeah. That's great. So you put your Stanford education to work for you when you put that uh, little, those three little pages together for the 
for the president of the school, right? There you go. Who th- there you go. Who'd have thought you'd gone to Stanford? I mean, I mean, I, I I mean, mean to know you, who would have thought you went to Stanford? Yeah. You'd have to catch me at a dinner party late, maybe to figure out I might know something about something. But, you know. Well, you know, not all actors are dummies, Frank. I know. I, I, I know. Uh, you know, my history with SCAD goes back to Bernie Casey. Uh, Bernie, oh, wow. Bernie Casey was one of the founders. He was on the board of trustees of the school. I think they were, when were you founded? In the mid 80s? 78. Yeah, 78. And I think Bernie Casey was, uh, Bernie Casey, the actor, um, mm-hmm. was a uh, founder of the school wow. and uh, on the original board of directors. Wow, I didn't know that. And cool, then, cool. And then my friend Peter Damsky, who was Mel Damsky's brother, was there on the faculty of SCAD. Uh, I met him. Yeah. I met him. He's, yeah. a, he's a really good guy. He's a yeah. really good guy. So how'd you, he, get your, how'd you get your start in acting? Well, so that's an interesting, another kind of weird, uh, unexpected sort of thing. So I took, you know, when I went to Stanford, I, I thought I was going to go into the diplomatic service. Um, I speak a number of languages and um, German fluently, English fluently. Well, you, um, went, you went to school in Germany for a year, didn't you? I went to a high school in Germany, yeah. Um, and I thought I was going to be a diplomat. So my major at Stanford was international relations um, with a focus on, talk about current events, um, NATO and Warsaw Pact wow. issues. Um, and my advisor at the time, who was a big kind of ac- young, hotshot academic in the, this new emerging field of international relations and transnational corporate relations and all that stuff, said, don't be stupid. Don't go into the government at 22 looking like you're 12. Go into business, work your way up, and then when you're a vice president at some bank or some investment bank, then take your test, then go into the foreign service, and you'll be at a much, much higher level. I said, great. So I got a job in my hometown of Chicago at Continental Bank. Cue the most miserable two years of my life. Um, As a young bank trainee in Chicago, going to work in three-piece suits, thinking... What the heck happened? Like, my life is over. I'm 22, and I see no, I, I see no, there's no exit here. I'm, I'm doomed. So let me, let me stop you. So you were 22 years old, and you had no illusions of being an actor at all at, at 22. None. 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 No, no training either in acting, right? Just no, no training other than, you know. Lying in bars, you know. Billy's familiar well, I'm with good that. At that. <laughs> <laughs> I could have won a few Oscars in a bar. No problem. <laughs> no training. No training. I I was. I remember I had a girlfriend at Stanford who, whose ex boyfriend was a theater major at Stanford, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? You went out with the theater major? Like, what is your problem? <laughs> so, a buddy of mine uh, said to me, oh my God, I, I, I go to this acting class. It's near your apartment. The girls are amazing. We go out after class and drink heavily. And I was like, I'm in. Sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. Chasing um, skirts. Uh, Chasing skirts. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, you ask 50% of the actors, and if they get right down to it, they'll sort of go, you know, I, I did my first show to either, you know, chase a girl, meet girls, you know, or whatever. Anyway. Well, um, n- not 50%, because 50% of the actors aren't. <laughs> a little no, that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but but anyway, you know, um, and then I had 
And then I'm, I'm there for a couple of uh, classes, and I'm showing up in my three-piece suit, getting out of a cab, and people are, what the hell is this kid with the suit? You know, what's going on? And we were doing the Meisner repetition exercise in class. And I just had this sort of moment of, like, truth in the exercise. And I felt this sort of energy, like, oh, my God, like, this is so amazing. This is so cool. And I got hooked. I got hooked. You know, I got really hooked, man. I got so hooked that I started a theater company. I quit the bank. I started a theater company. And then because of my background, I soon became the producer of all of our plays and the director of half of them. So my acting career, ironically, sort of was pushed to the rear and I became more of a producer and a director for like the next four to five years. And it's only when uh, John Malkovich asked me to come in and replace somebody in a play in New York that I, that my acting career, like I took that car out of the garage and kind of turned it over and the engine started, but I was like, wow, the engine started. I can't believe it. Okay. How did you know Malkovich? From Chicago, like his, his, his girlfriend who then became his wife, who's passed away, Glenn Headley, her roommate was my girlfriend at the time. So Malkovich and I, and these two girls would stay up till five in the morning playing risk and smoking cigarettes and talking about how bad theater was in Chicago. Yeah, Glenn Headley co-starred with Jay Thomas in Mr. Holland's Opus. Oh, yeah. She played uh, Richard Dreyfuss's wife. Yeah. She yeah. was a remarkable actress. She remarkable. was a remarkable actress. Remarkable. Yeah. So you, did, you didn't meet John Malkovich through your, your acting workshop. You met him out of coincidence, correct? Or Well, so when I'm doing... When I'm doing my acting classes at this theater uh, in Chicago, this theater has hired this group of young actors from Highland Park, up north suburb of Chicago, to come do a play, and it was the Seven Wolf Theater Company. And so I met all those guys in the fall of 1978. in Chicago, when I was still doing classes. And who was a member who else were members of Steppenwolf? Lori Metcalf, Jeff Perry, Terry Kinney, John Malkovich, Gary Sinise, Moira Harris. Wow. Pretty, and, pretty good and, group. And, pretty good yeah. company, yeah. Let me, let yeah. me ask you, D.W., if you go from, uh, like, Chicago, you did a lot of plays in Chicago, and then when you did with Malkovich, you did Bomb and Gilead, is that right, in, in, yeah, in New yeah, York? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Do you exactly. feel like it's a step up, like we were on Broadway? Does it, does it, at that age, you know, when you're young like that, you say, well, I'm on Broadway, does it, does that, does that impact you, or is it the same? So, as, uh, a play is a play is a play. I mean, look, the, the big, the big moment of, of, like, truth for all of us in Chicago was when, when Sinise and Malkovich took True West to New York in 83, and we're all sitting in a bar, about the bar we all used to go to, you know, lamenting, you know, the fact that six people came to our show last night or whatever, and someone threw down the New York Times, and it was Mel Gussow's review, and it basically said... I have seen the face of the American theater and it is on stage at the Cherry Lane and it is running through Chicago. Wow. And it changed overnight, kind of A, what we thought of ourselves. I mean, we thought we were pretty good, but we were just doing what turned us on. We, we didn't really have any measure of how to measure ourselves against anybody. We didn't give a shit, quite frankly. And then here comes the New York Times saying, John and Gary are the bar. Now, they're the new bar. And we're all going, well, yeah, it's a good play, but Jesus, are they the bar? So, cut to, we all go to New York. Like, all of us. And they hire us. Bang, 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 bang. And all the agents, bang, 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 bang. They, they suck us all up, you know. And we get there, and we realize 
it's New York and it's Broadway and all this stuff. Yeah. But it's still just two actors talking to each other on a stage, and either you're being truthful or you're not. So you can swim in 60 feet of water as easy as you can in three feet of water. <laughs> exactly. And, and quite frankly, the only real difference, the challenge for most of us was if we got in a Broadway play, you have to talk louder. That was kind of the, the big difference. <laughs> And, and dealing with, you know, New York actor bullshit, you know, about like, you know, oh, you're upstaging me or, uh, uh, uh. and I, we didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> we, were just on, we were just on stage just doing, just doing what we were doing just to try to make the play good. All right. Now, I'm going to stop you because you say you have to talk louder. So I, I, I realize what you're in Chicago, you may be working to 250 people and New York, you have to work to 2,500 people. So you yeah. have to speak louder. But does that speaking louder affect your acting at all? It can. You have to. It's, it's really you, you, you just have to. You have to just practice. And, and, and this is going to sound like silly, but you literally you just have to practice talking like this. And then pretty soon it just becomes, you know, I mean, you have to just literally. And then some of the people from Chicago did not have any vocal training, so they blew their voices. So they had to, you know, go to a vocal coach and all that kind of stuff. But we we got it after a while. But bear in mind, this is before they were miking everybody Correct. in Brooklyn. Correct. N now they mic everybody, so you know it's not that big of a deal. But when we were doing it, it, it was sort of like I can't hear you, I can't hear you. You know, they, they go up in the second balcony. Can't hear you. So, so it, okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Besides raising the decibels of your voice, does it? Do you, does your timing change at all with a bigger audience? Like if if there's a joke, you have to wait until it hits the back of the audience. It comes back. You have to pause longer. You know, that's that's you're 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 onto something there. Um, in the same way that I had to learn about a little kind of an incremental, like a half a second pause when I started doing sitcoms. Same thing on the Broadway stage. The joke hits 0.8 of a second later. But then, you know, once you're on there and you've done it a couple of times, you it's like you're, in, you're playing tennis and you're in a tennis court and it's a slick court and the ball's skidding a little bit. You've got to be a little bit quicker to the ball or you're playing on clay and the ball bounces higher, you just have to your adjust. Instincts, your instincts take over, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, you yeah. get a pretty – you know, I, I got to ask you, I mean, because you've done stage, you've done television, you've done movies. I'm not an actor. I mean, I've done some stand-up comedy, which is why I knew about timing. The larger the audience, you got to wait for the joke to hit the back. It takes you longer to go over. But – the biggest fear I would have, I would think, if I was acting on Broadway, is you, you, it's like a trapeze artist working without a net. You don't get a second chance. So are you, are you, is the big fear like you're going to forget a line, or has that ever happened to you? Did you ever have to add lip a line? Or? Well, um, yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> uh, so this is, a true, this is a true story, and it's kind of one of those, like, you know, like, so, so I, I've done a ton of theater. I've done, like, 50 or 60 plays in Chicago before I got to New York. Um, so I was very used to being on stage, having a shit ton of lines and all that stuff. And yes, I've forgotten lines. And yes, I've made shit up and, you know, found my way back into a play. My first night on Broadway, not my first play in New York, but my first night on Broadway, I was Peter Gallagher's understudy in Tom Stoppard's The Real Thing. Jeremy Irons was in it. And, um, uh, a couple of other folks were in it. And Lila Robbins, and she was a big, the Ballyhoo new graduate from Yale, and she was the hot new thing. And I'm taking over for Peter for two weeks because he's on vacation. I'm his understudy. And I come out, and the first scene with Lila is in a train compartment, and I come out in the dark, and the lights come up, and I say to her in my very practiced Scottish accent, is this seat taken? And based on other shit in the play, there's a huge laugh. And when that huge laugh hit me like a wave, like a sonic wave, 
my mind went blank. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I know that Mike Nichols and Tom Stoppard are in the eighth row. And I'm looking at Lila, and I'm looking at her, and nothing is coming to me. And I literally went like this to her. <laughs> and do you know what Lila did that, and I, g I gave her shit for this later on in life. She went like this. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized at that moment, I either remember the line right now, or I walk off stage and I get on a train back to Chicago because that's it. Whoa. And and the line came to me. So later that night, at that point in time, Mike Nichols had four shows on Broadway. And one of the shows was Whoopi Goldberg's one-man show. And every night, Whoopi had a party at her loft. And so we would all, all of us that were in Mike Nichols shows would all go to Whoopi's loft to these parties. So I bump into Mike Nichols at the party. And he goes, oh, DW, listen, you know that first moment? Not so long. <laughs> Tighten, that <up. laughs> Tighten that up. And I went, Mike, I went, I, I, I went up, dude. I lost, I, I didn't, I, I forgot my line. And the look in his eyes of like, like he was going to kill me. I went, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tighten that up, Mike. Whatever you want, brother. Yeah. But how astute he was to catch it after watching the whole play. And just that pause. Oh, Mike, so Mike, was a, Mike was a master technician. Mike was all about pace, volume. And it was all very, very orchestrated. Now, you know, Mike appreciated it if you had a moment of inspiration or whatever. But Mike's basic note to any actor that I've ever talked to with Mike, Mike's first note to any actor is this, faster. Three notes, faster. Three notes of comedy, faster, louder, funnier. There you go. I've always said, we always say, I've only got, I've only got one note for you on a TV sitcom. We go, Faster, louder, funnier. Yeah. Really? You yeah. know, it's funny because when I was doing comedy, when I started doing comedy, I started like at 62, 63 years old in college. I went back to college late. And I first started doing late. it. Late? Really late. <laughs> <laughs> really late. Really, really late. Really, really, really late. But when I first started doing it, of course, you're nervous when you get on stage and you have a tendency. I talk fast anyway. I'm from New York, but I had a tendency to talk too fast. And somebody told me, uh, uh, guy who had been in the business 20 years, he said, when you think you're talking too slow, go slower. But now you're telling me that basically you faster, faster louder, and funny. funnier. Who, who told you that? Donald D.W. Moffat. Nobody that ever made by, it. <laughs> by, by the way, what would happen? What would you think if a 62-year-old man walked into your class at SCAD? I would go right on, brother. You've had a moment of clarity. You've had a moment of inspiration. Welcome. Come on in. A moment of clarity showed up in AA. I think that's what they tell you. You got a moment of clarity, and I yeah, I went down to go. that school as well, along with Gamblers Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and every other kind of anonymous. <laughs> there you go. So how long? I mean, there's a, but there's a difference, though. It's interesting. There's a difference between faster and rushing your lines. Like, you can talk faster, but you still have to articulate, and you still have to, it still has to be real. But, you know, Mike was always about picking up cues, because a lot of being faster is just picking up your cue. It doesn't mean that you have to talk like this, you have to talk really fast like that. You know, it just means picking up your cue, being, being on it. Well, Nichols, yeah. Nichols started as a comic, too, with Elaine May. I mean, totally. that, was his, that, totally. was his, that was his deal. Yeah. Yeah, they were a very popular uh, nightclub act, and then they had records. My parents had their records. Yeah, no, I remember Nichol Nichols and May. Sure. Yeah. So w it, it took you two years to get your first movie, Black Widow. Was was that your first movie? <sighs> um, 
If you mean the first movie where I actually spoke? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. How many before yeah. that, before when you didn't speak? I'm just curious. I mean, how many? I, 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 I spoke, but in 1982, and when we were all like starving Chicagoans, I played a policeman who goes to Pam Dauber's front door because she's worried about a stalker played by Frank's favorite actor, David Soule. Um, and, and then I got stabbed and I went and I fell down the stairs. That was my first movie. That I was, was, was going to say, I, we usually say, how many dead bodies did you play before, <laughs> before you got to speak? Yeah. But then, you know, um, Black Widow, I think the first real movie movie I did was uh, uh, Early Frost, which was the that TV movie right. about AIDS. Right. That I did with Aiden Quinn. And then right after that, I got uh, Black Widow with Bob Rafelson. Now, you uh, did the, the movie. With, you did two movies about AIDS, did you not? Did you? I did the, the play Normal Heart oh, in sorry. New York. That was the I did, I was in the original cast of that play, which of course has gone on to have many many lives afterwards, and I'm, I'm and I'm happy I'm so happy that the play has gone on to have so many different um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for incarnations Frank? incarnations thank wow you. good word, good word Frank good very nice word. couple of syllables so there. then you, go then you had you were first of many killers serial killer in uh, Le Liza. Lisa. 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 Not Liza the, with a Z. Liza with the, a Z. The candlelight killer. The candlelight <laughs> killer. With, with a lovely Cheryl Ladd. I mean, I, I, I run into her occasionally. Oh, she's such a sweetheart. Yeah. Anyway. So I, I'm going to do a jump cut now to For Your Love because okay. that's where Don, DW, and I worked together. Uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, did uh, It was a, written and created by Yvette Lee Bowser, who was it? coincidentally a Stanford graduate do you think that's a c coincidence that you got cast in that movie uh, that she was as she a was, she, graduate she was gunning for me and I think the fact that I went to Stanford made her even more interested in gunning for me I think what do you mean gunning for you she wanted me on the show she yeah. wanted me to do the show yeah you know her son Drew is now the third baseman on Stanford University's baseball team Oh, my God. That is so great. He hit over 300 as a starting freshman last year, and he's hitting about 350 so far this year. So is she, he going to go to the pros? Is he going to go to the pros? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's 6'5". He's, he's, he's every player's dream. I mean, he's every well, team's fantastic. dream. He's a, he's a really good and – he's, and he's a great citizen, as you could imagine, being a son of – And what's, what's Evan doing? He's, he's big in music. He's, oh, wow. he's a music producer, and he went to uh, Ohio University, followed his dad. He went to Ohio University, and he's having a big impact on the music business. Great. So that's, and, and if you remember right, uh, Evan was born between the pilot and the first episode of uh, For Your Love. As was my daughter. Wow. Wow. How long did you guys work on For Your Love? Was that two four years, three years? years? Four years. We, 88 episodes. 88 episodes. We, yeah, it was four years. And uh, why don't you tell us a little about the cast? James, James Lejeur has already been a guest on our show. so James was, you know, I, I, I loved working on that show. It was, so I was married to Dee Dee Pfeiffer. Michelle it, was James, it was James and uh, Holly. And then... Uh, Tamela Jones and a, an actor named Adafe Blackman. Who, they, that was the six of us. Um, and I run into Tamela every once in a while. I, I every once in a while, I'll, I'll, you know, through Instagram or Twitter or something, Holly and I will say, "Hey, we got to get together." James and I have been telling each other for ten years now we're going to grab a cup of coffee, and it hasn't happened yet. But I love seeing all of them when they're working. I'm really it was a great experience, and I think the show, in a weird way, was like way ahead of its time. Um, and what was the premise of the show? I mean, basically, it was the first sort of kind of a feel-good family show, but but interracial. I mean, it was it was like imagine the Flintstones, but 
I'm Barney Rubble, and I'm a white guy, and James and Holly are Fred and Wilma, and they're black, and we are neighbors, and and that's and that's all we and that's all we do, and we just ha hang out. Yeah, and uh, the, the great thing about that was uh, Yvette always portraying people of color in upwardly upwardly mobile positions, and James was a uh, James was a lawyer. I forget what Holly was, but uh, Holly was. Uh, <sighs> She yeah. was like, didn't she work in radio or something? Yeah, I, I don't remember, but it was a high profile. Uh, yeah. And you really were Barney Rubble. I was Barney Rubble. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, would, they would dress me up in these weird outfits. And I'm, I'll never forget, I was sitting on the set and they, the, the camera crew was taking a break. And I had like foil in my hair because uh, Dee Dee was coloring my hair. So there was all these foil things in my hair. And Frank look, goes by and he looks at me and he goes, from Shakespeare to foil in the hair. <laughs> and, then, and then he walks away and he goes, getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and we, had a number Bottom of, line. we had a number of guests on that show too. Didn't Shaquille O'Neal show up in one episode? We had Scotty Pippen. We had Shaq. We had, um, and you know who I still see? Um, is in the grocery store in Malibu sometimes is Gabrielle Reese. Yep. Um, we, had a, we had a bunch of cool guest stars. I mean, it, I, I just, I thought the show was so interesting because it was, it was kind of effortlessly omniracial without that being what the show was about. And you made your directing debut. On For yeah. Your Love, you directed eight episodes. And a young yeah. fellow by the name of Jason Bateman, I think his name is, he was also, he made his directing debut on For Your Love as well. Yeah, yeah, Jason, I'll never forget, Jason used to always say that this is the dream job. You have the dream job. You're a regular on a show. Everyone likes each other. You're directing episodes. I wish I had your life. I just want to be on this show and have a son and take him to Little League games. Well, the only difference is now that Jason's Golden Globe winner, he's got two daughters. He does not take them to the Little League games, but he's doing okay. Yeah, I don't think they're taking up any collections for uh, yeah. Jason Bateman. No, no, he's, he's doing really good. killing it. But when you're when you're in a show like that, and he says it's a dream job, you know, you're you're almost like a family. You're working together for that many episodes. Having spun, you know, Broadway and movies and then television. Do you have a preference? I mean, if it was up to you, would you pour yourself into one rather than the other? Do you miss Broadway? Do you? I mean, I, I, I love theater. The, the issue, it becomes an economic issue at, at, at a certain point in time if you have a family. You know, for me to do it, once I had my daughter, and certainly once I had my son, if I decided to do a play, I was hoping to break even and not lose money doing the play, e even though they were paying me well, because it just, the economics just don't work in your favor unless you are the star of the show and commanding a very high salary because, you know, you're in New York or London and, you know, lodging is incredibly expensive. Schools are expensive. Meals are expensive. Everything's expensive. You still got your house in LA, you're paying the mortgage, you got car payments, all that stuff. Things we never so, even think about. Ever in a million years with a layman thinking about that. You just think you're on Broadway and you're, and you're paying ten percent to an agent and five percent to a manager and yeah. X amount to a publicist, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Sure so, dropped and, when you said that. And, I, I and, couldn't believe and, it. And then your normal third of your salary or twenty five percent of your salary goes to Uncle Sam. So in yeah. essence you're doing Broadway if you're not the star of the show. Just to get credit. I mean, it's yes. I, I mean, if you're, if for me, there are a number of factors come into it. First of all, you know, at, at my age, having been around as long as I've been around, I don't want to expend the energy on a play unless it's phenomenal. It's just, it, it's not worth it. It's it's too much of an energy investment, too much of a time investment, just emotionally. That's number one. Number two, there's the economics. Now, my kids are both, I'm an empty nester now. So if I said to Crystal, hey, I got a Broadway show. Let's go to New York for six months. She might go, great. 
And then, you know, we could maybe Airbnb our house. I don't know. I'd have to work it out. On all things being all things being equal, it would be lovely, an amazing life to do one play a year, one movie a year, and then maybe some kind of a sitcom or a TV show or a limited series. Bing, bing, bing. Yeah, but you that might, would be you, a phenomenal life. You might want to work scad in there too. <laughs> <laughs> Always the bottom line, Frank. Frank's with the bottom no. line. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm working scad in right now. You know, all, all, all I'm doing today, like, is just catching up on emails. Um, but it's, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just in terms of as a performer, th that would be the ideal kind of thing. One play a year, one movie a year would be ideal. I have to say, the teaching has provided me with sort of a, an intellectual home, if you will, or a, a place where I get to use my brain muscles in a very different way, which I really appreciate. Plus, I love, I love being a mentor. And, you know, I've got a thousand students. I have a thousand students in the film department. Wow, can you imagine yeah. that guy at Stanford if he could see you now? The guy, the guy that gave you advice to uh, be a yeah. diplomat. How to be a diplomat. If he how could to be see, a diplomat. If he could what see the hell you happened now. to you? What the hell happened to you? Yeah. So after For Your Love, you had a successful career. You've been in Grey's Anatomy, Switched at Birth, Criminal Minds, Chicago Med, How to Get Away with Murder. That, uh, But a big one would be Friday Night Lights. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about that experience? So... You know, I'd done For Your Love, then I'd done a couple of pilots, and, you know, the movie, the, 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 and you know this better than anybody, Frank, that the, the business was shifting. The business was shifting into a leaner, meaner production model, uh, starting with the fees they pay actors for pilots, and you know, guest star fees, you know, it was no more it was never, it was not a negotiation anymore. It was just sort of like, we want you to do this part, top of show, take it or leave it. If you don't want it, we're moving on to the next guy on the list. That's changing now though, because uh, actors like you are in great command because b before when we were doing For Your Love, there were only four networks and there, yeah. there, was, there was NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox. Uh, there were four networks. Now, with the advent of streaming, there are so many freaking networks, and the actors are very much in demand, and they're getting paid very much more than they ever did before. Well, I'm not getting paid more than I was before, but that's because, Frank, you you, you put the word out on me, and, that's, and they're just not paying. <laughs> yeah. Bad <laughs> extra. Um, but, but when For Your Love, I mean, not For Your Love, when, when Friday Night Lights came along, it was one of these deals where they want you to be a guest star for three episodes, top of show. And I was like, I heard, you know, I knew Connie Britton. I'd done a movie with her. And so I was like, okay, you know, but this is one of those great sort of learning. I mean, I, I sort of knew this, but it reminded me, I always want to do a good job. I always want to be, you know, do my best because you never know. You never know who's going to see the episode. You never know who's, you know, whatever. So I'm doing this show. And they start talking to me about they want to do more episodes. But because of budget stuff, they couldn't pay me any more money. And I was kind of like, oh, come on. just. And I was sort of acting like I wasn't going to do any more episodes because they weren't going to pay me. And Jeff Reiner, who was the executive producer director, saw me on the airplane going back to L.A. And he goes, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure, man. He goes, I understand, and this is really none of my business, but I just want to tell you something. The shit they are writing for you is crazy good. So artist to artist, I understand that there's a money issue, but artist to artist, I'm telling you, you really don't want to leave this character yet. And I, I believed him, and it turned out to be a great thing. Now was Peter Berg the guy who was uh was, was right? Peter Peter created the show and directed a number of the episodes. Um, 
and you know, I, you know, I met Peter on the set, and Peter was a big fan of my character and loved how nutty I was as the character. But, you know, it was really Jeff Reiner who was kind of the, the director who really dialed me in. And I think kind of realized what a great foil my character could be for um, Kyle Chandler. And so that's why I wound up doing, you know, 20 of those episodes. Well, Kyle Chandler really catapulted that thing. I mean, he went on to do all kinds of things. I mean, was, yeah, it, was that his big, big shot, big break? That was it? I, I would say that was his big break. Yeah. So, Billy, have any other questions for Don? Yeah, I do got I have a do have a question. Of course, I did some research when I heard you were coming on, and I was quite impressed. What the hell were you doing in Afghanistan in 2009? So... You know, the, the Defense Department has a whole department, in, inside the Defense Department, there's a whole area that is responsible for the kind of the leisure time well-being of soldiers all across the globe. And part of that is they ask the soldiers, you know, what shows do you watch? Like, what movies do you watch? And then they go out to subcontractors who, can, who contact talent, and they say, the soldiers really love Friday Night Lights. Would you be willing to come to Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever? And so for me, it was Iraq first and then Afghanistan. And I, I just said one thing to them. I said, look, I'm not about, you know, beating any war drum or beating any political drum. I want to go thank people for their service. And they said, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. So that's what I did. I went to Baghdad in May of 2009, and I went to Afghanistan in October of 2009. Well, that's, that's really cool. I didn't, I didn't know why you were there, but I, uh, I can tell you, I was in Vietnam in 69. And when the Bob Hope show came, it was a really big deal for us. I mean, it yeah, was, it was I a remember, really big deal. Yeah, I remember talking to a, a, you know, what's funny is that, you know, the, I was as old as the generals when I was over there, you know, the, I'm talking to a lieutenant in Iraq, and we were right next to Sadr City, which was where there was a lot of insurgency and combat. And I said to this guy, you know, we, the day was over, we'd sign stuff and we'd said hi to everybody, and I said, Man, I I hope we're not like a pain in the ass. And I, I know I see how much effort you guys go through to make us feel comfortable and set the tables up and make sure we have all this stuff. And the and these girls from the horror movies are like, you know, they they the air conditioning is not working and they're bitching and all this stuff. He goes, Oh no, 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 no. You have no idea. My guys have been talking about you guys coming for like four weeks. What I worry about is my boys killing themselves. You guys are a blessing. And you took their minds off of this shit for four weeks plus. So thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you too, man. Even though I wasn't in Iraq or Afghanistan, believe me, it meant an awful lot to us. In Nam and well, I appreciate that, man. But I'm just deal. telling you, it, was it made me feel so good because... I was like, oh, God, thank God I'm not, like, wasting these guys' time or making them do. So it, it made me feel good that I did it. It, it. it did, yeah. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Switched at Birth. What was that? How about Coda? How about Coda? I don't know what Coda is. I know what Switched at Birth was, and I know you directed a lot of episodes of Switched so at Birth. Coda is the movie that's up for an Oscar, Frank, that is – and about a deaf family. Oh, it, you're in that? No, no, but, but Marley's in it, and Daniel, the kid who plays her son, was on our show. He's in it. And I mean, you know, I just, when we did Switch to Birth, the idea of a movie like Coda was, I don't think, I don't think in the, in the realm of possibility. Gotcha. gotcha. And I think, you know, when I read the pilot for Switch to Birth, I said to my agent, well, if America is ready for subtitles, this could be an amazing show. 
But that's the question. Can America handle subtitles on an episodic show? And I think the question got answered because we were on for 103 episodes. Um, Is that the longest run of your career? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 103 episodes of Switched at Birth, 88 episodes of For Your Love, 20 yeah. episodes of Friday Night Lights. You've had a nice little life as a diplomat. I I, I've had some good runs. I've had some good runs. <laughs> Life is a tip. And you're also the father of acclaimed international fashion model, Lily Stewart, aren't you? I am. I am. How did that come about? What was it like for you to see Lily's success as a father? Well, I mean, I'm delighted for her because in a weird way, you know, she never wanted to be an actor. She always wanted to. She always loved fashion. And I kept telling her, yeah, 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 put, you know, thinking it would go away. And then when she got braces, I said, honey, I can't, you know, you can't do this because I have braces. The day her braces came off, daddy, you promised me, you promised me. So I took her, um, my agent at Innovative set up an appointment for her at Ford in LA. That's and we're Ford. driving there. She's 14 years old, Ford models. Right. She's 14 years old. The braces have just come off. We're driving there. I said, honey, these people, they might be a little cold. They might be a little abrupt. They might not be very sensitive. So if they hurt your feelings, don't take it personally. And we're just going to go home. And just I'm just letting you know that it might not be all warm and fuzzy. They could not have been nicer. And we're welcoming and blah, blah, blah. And we're driving out the parking lot in Beverly Hills. And they, my agent calls from Innovative and said they want to sign her. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, what? <laughs> yippee! So well, no, I'm not yippee. I'm because I know that I got to drive her around town now. She gets license. But you know, she's been. She left home when she was 16. She went. She lived in London. She's lived in you know. She lived in Paris. And she's lived in New York since she was 16. Like she has, she had her own apartment since she was 16. Um, so. She is incredibly mature and an incredibly mature 24-year-old. She bought a house in Topanga, Frank. She's down the street from us. <laughs> That's great. I mean, when I was 24, I couldn't pay my bar tap, Frank. I didn't own a house. She's walking a tall I mean, cotton. Huh? How, did, how, did, how did you deal with that being six, with a daughter, 16-year-old, living in an apartment in New York by herself? Well, the... There are a lot of horror stories about models and the business and people taking advantage of them and, and all that stuff. The good news for Lily was always, she was always with really, really good agents, really top agents. And she always had us to talk to her. You know, and she grew up in a, in a showbiz family. So she sort of, it wasn't like, I'm in New York. I'm a model. Like she realized, oh, this is how I'm going to make some money now. Right. And so she was very workmanlike about it. Also, how she's taking care of herself. That's the one thing we did do as mom and dad. We have had her, she's been in dialogue with a dietitian since she was 16 to talk about Shows, season's coming up. This is my diet. So she's in amazing physical shape, but she also eats more than I do. I don't know how she does it, but she does. It. But we were very clear that we were not going to go down the two peanuts, cocaine, and cigarette diet. We're not going to do that. Now, Billy was on that for years. <laughs> <laughs> All the good it did me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I dated a ballerina one time, and she told me there was more drugs, more drugs in the ballet than there is on the rock stage. Like uh, because they're all got to stay skinny, and they all yeah, speed, coke. Like you know, forget yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you. You said your your daughter uh, had an apartment in London and Paris. When you were in London at the Old Vic, opposite Kevin Spacey in the Philadelphia Story, did you watch the movie for research, the original one, the Stuart uh, Cary Grant one, or High Society, or did you? Do you, you do research like that? Do you watch how other people approach the role? Um. Yes and no. It's it's not like 
first of all, the the screenplay for that movie is a little different than the play. Um, the movie sort of it's an abridged version of the play. Um, you know, I didn't really steal anything from Jimmy Stewart's performance. I mean, I you know I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Jimmy Stewart, but I, I sort of I realized this character had to be very grounded and very American in this British world. Um, this aristocratic world. I was this kind of, you know, guy with his feet on the ground and like, you know, bullshit, fancy rich people. But, you know, other than that, I didn't really, um, I don't tend to look at if I do something that someone else has done, Yeah. I don't look to their performance uh, as a resource. Uh-huh. I, I, I'm happy to watch it and see what they did, but I, I usually just go about what I want to do with it. Yeah, so you think it could actually affect it adversely? Like if you, if you, I mean, it could. I think you know, the younger you are, the less experienced you are, the more apt watching someone else's performance might affect your performance. I've been doing this for so long. If I watch somebody do something, I go, Jesus, they're doing that a lot better than I ever could. Or, yeah, I don't like what they're doing. And just do my own thing. I, I at, at, at this point, I, it wouldn't really matter. But, you know, it was interesting. One thing I didn't do early on, and I wish I had done early on more, because I was from the theater, I did not like seeing myself on film. I did not like watching myself on that film. That was my next question. Do you ever watch yourself on film? I do now all the time because I realize it's part of the craft. Like I have to see how I look, how I'm doing, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm usually these days I give myself, you know, thumbs up. I wish I had had the ability to distance myself enough and to look at myself because I know that I would have become a better actor, a better film actor faster if I had spent the time looking at myself in the early days. More, That's really interesting. More. Like you almost cringe, I would imagine, to be afraid to watch yourself early. Is that it? Like, it, well, it, I mean, because like, imagine like when I first was on film in the 80s, no one had a video camera. Very few people had a video camera. No one had no, no iPhones. There's no self-recording devices. The only thing we had was like, you know, tape. You could hear yourself, but you never saw yourself. So when you see yourself for the first time, you just go, oh, my God. <laughs> That's how I look. And you can't even, you know, now I look at what I'm doing like, am I blinking too much? Is, my, is the angle of my face, you know, like it's all very... I look because, you know, because a lot of it's here. Yeah. So you have to really understand how you're using your instrument. Not just, you know, when you're on stage, it's everything. And I was too in love with the theater when I first started on camera. I didn't realize how different it is. It's so different. Classic line. I remember Dick Cavett was interviewing Robert Mitchum. And he said to Robert Mitchum, it's been said you've never seen one of your own films. And Mitchum just deadpanned and says, they don't pay you to watch them. (laughs) (laughs) Derek, do you have uh, any questions for DW? Yeah, I I do have a few questions. Uh, First question is, uh, why are some actors more famous than others? Like from an an actor's point of view. So I I have written down Keanu Reeves, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt. And uh, sort of like a sub-question is, is it talent? So, I know a lot of very, very talented actors that no one in this Zoom has ever heard of. And they're really, really deeply talented actors. Um, Fame, to me, has as much to do with luck as talent. And, yeah. (laughs) Frank is a... (laughs) Frank's got a touchdown thing up because he wrote that in the book, and if these lips could talk, exactly what he said. You know. And 
And and these days, it also has to do with, you know, fame also. I think actors who deeply want to be famous have a lot more control over that because they, they lean really heavily into social media. They lean really heavily into all the things that make you famous. Here's the deal. Fame, in my opinion, my wife and I were just talking about this, deeply overrated, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I have gone, I've had a, an amazing life. I've had an amazing life. I put my kids through school. I've paid my bills. I've had a great life. And I have a very nice private life. When I walk down the street, I don't have a bunch of people screaming at me. I don't think people understand the price of that. Because to not have your anonymity, to not have your privacy, to not have the ability to go sit in a cafe and watch people and not have 50 people come over and want to take a selfie with you, that's a big sacrifice. Yeah, I I said in the book, I think fame killed Elvis, fame killed Michael Jackson, and fame killed Prince. It is deep. There's a big price. And not only for you, but it's for your family, for your children. And I think the people that realize this, they realize this deal with the devil that they've made, it can be very debilitating, hmm. even, even as Frank says, can be fatal. Yeah, I look at guys like, uh, you know, rock bands like Keith Richards. Everybody talks about Keith Richards, how he's had blood drained and put back in how many times or whatever. I think he looks great. <laughs> I'm thinking if I was in the Rolling Stones, there's no way I would have been 10 years. I would have been dead like 10 years in. Forget it. Yeah. You almost yeah. got a spectator out of DW. <laughs> <laughs> almost got a spectator. Keith Richards looks great as far as I'm concerned. I mean, God yeah. bless him. Looking good, Bell. Hanging in. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I, I can only imagine. Yeah, so switching gears on that same on that same sort of question, who is who's the who's the best actor? So I know you know some people that are not notable, but who's the best uh, notable actor that uh, it, it could be of past? They they don't have to be alive, but uh, who would you put in that category? Well, I, I can only speak from my my personal experience. Um, so. The actor who kind of like rocked my world, even before um, I had, you know, left college, I remember seeing Taxi Driver when I was in college. And I remember watching Robert De Niro's performance. And I remember thinking to myself, is that allowed? (laughs) Like, is that like, is that legal what he's doing? Like, it was so, it was so, Outside of anything I'd ever seen before, I was kind of like, what the hell's going on? Wow. And and De Niro, to my generation of actors, De Niro Pacino, huge influence in terms of commitment to the craft, taking risks, um, you know, a big, and, and Nicholson too, you know, just... And I, you know, I've, I've auditioned with De Niro. I've auditioned with Nicholson, and you know, you know, just meeting those guys. I will also say, you know, I'm a big Robert Duvall fan because, mm. and um, you know, Duvall, Duvall and um, Morgan Freeman are both just they're kind of everyman actors, but to me, like so talented and so minimalist you know like i remember rehearsing with duval and thinking is this all he's gonna do and then shooting with him and going is this all he's gonna do and then seeing the movie and going oh fuck (laughs) (laughs) perfect this guy is so good he's so good you know there was a movie called i believe it was called true confessions and duval was in it with uh de niro and uh, I thought Duvall blew away De Niro. 
in that movie is an incredible performance. Just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he was yeah. great in The Godfather as well. I mean, he was just well, terrific. That, and then, that goes without saying. Without saying, he was terrific. I mean, just Robert. Like, Robert. I mean, Duvall is great. He's the cab driver in Bullet. If you go back and watch Bullet, he plays this little tiny role. He's a cab driver. He's he's fantastic. You know, he's and 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 Freeman. If you guys have never, if you guys ever seen Street Smart, no, I don't think I have that. No, it's, no. A, it's a it's a it's a Gorham Globus. Moot from the eighties. Remember that? Yeah, sure. Those guys. Yeah, it was a Chris Reeve vehicle, Street Smart. I just wrote it down. I'm going to watch. And Morgan Freeman plays a pimp with Kathy Baker. Wow. Morgan Freeman frightened me in that. Like I was frightened. I'm in my apartment in in, in Hollywood, and I'm scared because he was so good. Well, that that brings me back to Taxi Driver. Because when I saw it, I felt that so I felt that movie was so disturbing. Yeah, I I didn't want to watch any other movie besides Bambi. Well, that was Bambi. <laughs> Bambi Bambi had also, also had an unhappy ending. So I want I didn't want to watch Snow White or something for the next three years because I was yeah. so disturbed by Taxi Driver. I know it was so intense. Yeah. He was so good in Scorsese that. Scorsese has a bit part in that too, right? He's in the back seat of the cab. He's like, got a uh, bit part in every movie yeah. he's ever done. Has yeah. he? Is he a Hitchcock type thing? Yeah, really? I, think so. I didn't know that. Uh, I, we're we're going to let you go, DW. But Billy, you have a closing question? No, man. I just uh, just thank you so much for being here and uh, really really cool advice you gave to any upcoming actors that might happen to watch the show or whatever. Uh, and uh, just a pleasure to get to know you, man. Really I got to get some. I got to get a couple more things before. Uh, sure. Sorry. Sure. Um, first of all, what grocery store do you uh, shop in? Since <laughs> Gabrielle Union is there. <laughs> and then uh, you speak multiple languages. What languages? So I'm fluent in English and German. Um, <laughs> my you're Italian. Fluent, you're, fluent, you're fluent in English. Really? I'm, fl I'm fluent in English. I'm, fluent in English. <laughs> I'm full of it in English. Yeah, I'm full of it in English. I speak full of German. Um, I'm uh, Italian, French, Russian, and then Macedonian. What? Macedonian? Okay. How the hell did that slide in there? I directed a play there in 2019 in Skopje, and I took... I took classes when I was there, and I continued taking them up until quite recently um, because it just became a, a time suck. But during the pandemic, I, um, you know, I took a lot of uh, language classes, and my Macedonian is pretty good. And I'm planning on going back because I'm actually involved with a consortium. We're gonna we're going to be developing the. Um, Building eight sound stages in Scopia. Great! Wow. Wow. wow, fantastic! Wild! All right. Does it get easier when you're learning multiple languages? I mean, the first language is really tough. Does it get easier as you? People in Europe usually speak three or four languages. Not you know. But what, I, I tell you what I'm what I'm good at is because I learned German so young. I'm really good with accents. Like I don't have a. I know I speak American, but I'm I can very easily. Go to a different accent. A lot of Americans cannot do that. Yeah. Grammar, grammar-wise, some languages are so different from each other. You know, the Latin-based languages: French, Italian, Spanish. Spanish is my next one, by the way. Those are they're very similar, and so the only problem there is that certain words are, are very, very similar. So you'll be speaking Italian, and you'll start using French or something. Russian and Macedonian are similar, but Russian has very different grammar than Macedonian. So that's, it's always the grammar, the, 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 the peculiarities of certain grammar things that always trip you up. So can you say, uh, is this seat taken with your best goddess action? Is this seat taken? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you took your seat today. DW. Thanks. Thank you, brother. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you so much. much. And, and we'll be in touch. I'll All be, right. I'll be in All touch right. with you next week for sure. Sounds good, Frank. All right. Nice to meet you, man. Take care. Thank you, man. Nice meeting you as well. Take care, pal. Bye. Really good. So, 
we've done it again. That, that was uh, remarkable in the languages. That blew me away. I, uh, you know, when I was, what gets me about language is that when you go to different countries, you can learn something about the history of the country just by the language they're speaking. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to the Philippines, they'll be speaking Filipino, and all of a sudden the Spanish word will come in, and I'll recognize the Spanish word, right? Tagalog. Say who? Tagalog. Tagalog? Yeah, it's not Filipino. I just, you know, I don't want you to get beat up in the comments. <laughs> but what happens is, like, they didn't have horses in the Philippines until the Spaniards bought the horses. So the horses is a Spanish name. When I was in Vietnam, they use occasionally a French word or swear, buku. They use buku. You know, they'll they'll say because of the French occupation. Sure. You know, so I mean, it, you can actually learn something about the history of each country by paying attention to the language. But the master that many languages in that. Yeah, I I didn't know Don was that deep. Man, <laughs> Macedonian. I mean, and when he started doing it in 2019, he's like still learning languages, the creating synapses. So he doesn't go see now like me. Yeah, but the thing that he was, a, he was a 22 year old Stanford graduate with no aspirations of acting at Ooh. all, and he made a career switch almost on the fly. Pretty within four years. It's pretty wild how this is. This is like a running theme. Was that luck? Luck be a lady well, tonight? Well, luck, yeah. obviously, luck. And then a lot of the actors just had no, actually, just about everybody had no interest in whatever career path. Yeah, well, that's the kind of people I sort of align myself to. Uh -huh. uh, because, you know, the kid actors, when they, when they grow, grow up to be five or six, so few of them become a Ron Howard, or so few of them become a Jason Bateman. Uh, and even even if they do, they make their careers off camera as just as much. I mean, who ever heard of Leave It to Beaver, Jerry Mathers, today? I mean, you know. The, the, well, that's your advice to all young talent, isn't it? You always say be versatile. If you if you're going to stay in the business, learn this, learn that, learn this, learn that, learn as much as you can. Learn Macedonia. <laughs> learn ma learn Macedonia <laughs> because you may. You know, now he's building eight sound stages in Macedonia. Yeah, well, you know what that means. That means Boku Bucks yes. <laughs> for Macedonia. So uh, if, as, if, as long as Putin keeps his mitts off of it. Well, it really is remarkable. I mean, uh, like you said, luck in the book, if these lips could talk, you talk often about being in the right spot at the right time. And he opened the interview with when the door opens, be ready to walk through it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, be prepared. And like he said, uh, there are so many great actors that you never even heard of. I, I, when I go to Vegas or any place else and I go into a, a lounge show and I see a guy playing guitar and he's, I'm saying, how could this guy not be famous? He's tremendous. It's, he's terrific. But Luck be a lady tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. With that. I'm the guy you came in with. <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy you came in with. And with that, we'll go out with this on the same note. Have a, have a good time, uh, and we'll see you next and week. Thanks for looking in. We appreciate it. We really do. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, guys. <laughs> see you in church. <laughs> next week's guest, winner of CBS's Amazing Race, producer and host of the College Tour TV series, Alex Boyle.